Hi, in this episode I'm going to talk about the optical fibers. Such fibers have circular cross-section and consist of a core with higher refractive index and a cladding, which refractive index is lower. Size of the core is typically of the order of micrometers, from a few micrometers for single-mode fibers to tens of micrometers in multi-mode fibers. Typical size of the whole structure is 125 micrometers, up to hundreds of micrometers for some special applications. Commercially used fibers look like cables, with various connectors. Even a piece of plastic in the air forms an optical fiber. Light propagation is based on a total internal reflection, a phenomenon that I discuss in the previous lectures. The angle of incidence alpha must be greater than the critical angle. Now we can use Snell's law at the boundary between the surrounding medium and the core, and between the core and the cladding. We can prove that the sign of the angle of incidence, gamma, must be lower than some value depending on the refractive indexes of the core, cladding and surrounding medium. Angle gamma also forms so-called cone of incidence, so the light that is large at angles within such cone can be potentially propagated in the fiber. This is a necessary condition. However, it is not sufficient, so it does not mean that we will have a guided mode for such angles of incidence. Moreover, this condition only takes into account the geometry of the fiber. A better lunging condition is based on a diffraction of the beam. Any beam diffracts, and its width increases while we are getting farther from the waist. For instance, at a distance of Rayleigh lengths, the beam width increases square root of 2 times in comparison to the width at waist. In the same way, a beam which exits the fiber diffracts. On the other hand, launching light into a fiber is an opposite process to diffraction. So we can assume that the beam at waist W0 is the width of a mode that is propagated in a fiber. In such case, angle gamma has to fulfill slightly different condition. We see that the maximum incident angle depends on the refractive index of the medium, width of the mode and the wavelengths of light in a surrounding medium. How such fibers are made? Well, at first we have to make a preform. One of the common processes is called MCVD, Modified Chemical Vapor Deposition. We take a silica glass tube, into which gases are introduced, typically oxygen, silicon tetrachloride and germanium tetrachloride. Tube is rotated and heated evenly up to 1600 degrees of Celsius. After some time a thin layer is deposited on the inner part of the tube. To collapse the tube it is heated up to 2000 degrees. Diameter of such preform is much larger than the diameter of a fiber. Preform is then used to pull fibers on so-called drawing towers. Heated materials falls due to the gravitation and is winded on a spool. Diameter of a fiber is constantly controlled and the speed of pulling is appropriately adjusted. There are also other methods of making a preform. Core can be doped with various materials and the fiber of course is also coated with some additional protecting layer. So what I'm showing you is just a simplified concept of how the fibers are made. Now let's take a look at the electric field. If we use Helmholtz equation in cylindrical coordinates for the longitudinal component of the electric field, we end up with a Bessel equation. The solution to this equation is a linear combination of Bessel functions. Let's draw these functions versus radial coordinate. We see that function y, a Bessel function of the second kind, diverges to minus infinity when its parameter is equal to zero. It means that this function cannot be a solution in the core. We do not want to have an infinite electric field. On the other hand, function j, a Bessel function of the first kind, looks reasonable. In the cladding, function i, a Bessel function of the second kind, diverges to infinity as we are getting farther from the core. It is not physical. The energy of such electric field would be infinite. So this function also cannot be a solution. Then, in the cladding, we leave only k function a modified Bessel function of the second kind, which approaches zero far from the core. So finally, we can say that the longitudinal component of the electric field in the core is described by the Bessel function of the first kind and in the cladding by the modified Bessel function of the second kind. R is just a radial coordinate. In optical fiber, the characteristic equation is much more complicated than in planar waveguides. Typically, we have to solve it numerically. Only some special cases can be simplified. 
By solving this equation, we get propagation constants beta. Each solution corresponds to a particular mode, particular distribution of the electric field. In other words, to some shapes of the electric field that can be propagated in a fiber. These propagation constants are the only unknown values and are part of gamma and kappa coefficients. All other parameters are known. Let's consider a case for m which is equal to zero. So we are taking into account TE, transverse electric, and TM, transverse magnetic modes. The equation simplifies a lot. By using some special function identities, we can get rid of derivatives of special functions. Instead of derivative of J0, we can write minus J1. Instead of a derivative of K0, we can write minus K1. We end up with much easier equations. Still, we have to solve them numerically or graphically, but it is way easier to use special functions than their derivatives. So we have two equations, one for TE and one for TM. Solutions will once again give us propagation constants beta. When we take a look at the transverse components of the electric field of such modes, it appears that transverse electric modes have only tangential component and transverse magnetic modes only the radial component of the electric field. TE and TM modes have only three field components. How do we classify modes, these distributions of the electric field? Well, if M is equal to zero, it means that we have either TE or TM mode. The second number in a subscript is just a solution number. So we have TE01, TE02, TE03 and so on. If M is greater than zero, we say about hybrid modes, HE and EH. In contrast to TE and TM modes, which have only three components of the fields, hybrid modes have all six components, three electric field and three magnetic field components. The difference between HE and EH comes from the ratio between the longitudinal components of the electric and magnetic fields. The second number is still a solution number corresponding to the subsequent propagation constants. In planar waveguides, we introduced quantities called the normalized frequency and the cutoff frequency. In optical fibers, they are derived in a very similar way. The only difference is that in planar waveguides we use the thickness of the core, and here we have a radius of the core, A. Moreover, cutoff frequency is defined for gamma approaching zero. If gamma approaches zero, it means that all the energy escapes from the core. Imagine that a modified Bessel function k, which describes the electric field in the cladding, behaves like the exponential function. If the exponent is zero, and it happens when gamma is zero, it means that the electric field is constant everywhere. As the energy cannot be infinite, it means that there is no energy in the core. After some simple operations, we end up with an equation where a Bessel function of the first kind and the zeroth order must be equal to zero. This equation has infinite number of solutions. The first few are shown on the graph. The first one is for the frequency V equal to approximately 2.4. It means that if the normalized frequency of the fiber is lower than 2.4, there are no TE or TM modes. So TE and TM modes are not always guided, so they are not fundamental. For M, which is equal to 1, the equation is different. This time a Bessel function of the first kind and the first order must be equal to 0. The first solution is for V which is equal to 0. It corresponds to a hybrid mode HE11. This mode is fundamental because it can be always propagated in a fiber as long as the refractive index of the core is higher than the refractive index of the cladding. The shape of the light intensity of this mode is very characteristic. It has a single maximum. It looks like a Gaussian beam, but in fact it is a Bessel function. Solving characteristic equation in a general form and describing modes with Maxwell equations can be complicated. However, for many applications, some approximations can be made. If we assume that the refractive index of the core is similar to the refractive index of the cladding, which is actually true in most cases, the things are getting way easier. The characteristic equations for HE and EH modes are much simpler. Moreover, it can be proved that the characteristic equations for HEQ plus 1 and EHQ minus 1 are the same. It means that both modes have the same propagation constants, so they have the same phase velocity. 
If so, we can treat a superposition of these two modes as a new virtual mode. We call them linearly polarized modes and denote as LPQB, where B is a solution number. So for a Q equal to 0, LPOB mode is just HE1B mode, so this is the only one real mode. For Q equal to 1, we have a combination of HE2B and TE or TM mode. And for Q which is greater or equal to 2, we have a superposition of HEQ plus 1 and EHQ minus 1 modes. The light of linearly polarized modes is in fact linearly polarized, only in theory. However, in real life, due to impurities and fabrication difficulties of the fibers, the polarization is never ideal linear. Longitudinal component of the electric field is very weak. There are mostly transverse components of the electric field. And, as I said before, the LP modes for Q greater or equal to 2 consist of two modes, HE and EH, which have very similar, in theory identical, propagation constants. I hope you enjoyed this video about the theoretical basics of optical fibers. If you have questions, put them in the comments below. Thanks for watching. See you next time. Bye.